following is a video presentation by the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. All right, so first off, pop health and environment, clearly three really important um, dimensions of well-being, and these particular integrated programs working to kind of identify the linkages here. So what about those linkages? Certainly, if you're concerned about the environment, population matters, doesn't it? Um, one really uh, basic example, sorry about that, this is a map, a spatial representation of the distribution of population across the globe. Don't worry about the numbers on it. Look at the boundaries. The boundaries are ecological hotspots, so areas where um, biodiversity is very high. And the brown shading is population density. The main point being, a lot of places that are ecologically diverse are experiencing population pressure. They're not all white, are they? I mean, shaded white. They're not. There's some brown areas there. So keep in mind where those brown areas are. Concerned about health, if we're concerned about health and well-being, certainly the environment matters. Clean water, a pretty obvious example, right? With regard to that, here's another spatial distribution. This one, coverage of the world population with improved sanitation. Look at the red and yellow, mustard yellow spots, and those are areas where 50 to 75 percent um, don't of the population doesn't have improved sanitation. So certainly issues there related to clean water. If you think about the map you just saw, a lot of them overlap where there's population pressure, also la lack of sanitation, also biodiversity hotspots. So we're kind of zooming in on what PAG projects look like. Concerned about population issues? Well, certainly health matters, doesn't it? Think about population health linkages. Healthcare access obviously shapes life expectancy and quality of life. Access in many of these very places that have been highlighted on the last couple of maps is often constrained, including reproductive health services, a key piece of PHE programs. If we think specifically about reproductive health, about 70% of married women um, in high income settings make use of contraceptive services. If we look at this, these charts from UNFPA, um, about a quarter to a half in portions of Africa. So suggesting that there's a tremendous amount of unmet um, demand. Reproductive health, with regard to reproductive health again, research reveals uh, the benefits of women having a choice with regard to family planning. <coughs> benefits include improved maternal and infant health and expanded opportunities for women's education, employment, and social participation. That's a picture of a community health worker that we visited in Madagascar, I visited in Madagascar, with a poster that she takes to educate women about family planning. So there's the three linkages, the PHE programs identifying, trying to identify the overlaps and really work at where they come together, all three of them, um, intersection there in the middle. So let's offer, let me offer now an, a specific illustration. Some of you I understand just got back from here. Um, those that were lucky enough to go to the last meeting in the Philippines. But this is from the Philippines, a place where there is tremendous population pressure in certain parts of the country, doubling by 2040. Health issues for sure, um, high rates of malnutrition, and on many island communities with very little access to health care, or virtually no access to health care. And an environment that's characterized by high levels of biodiversity um, and endemism. This is the particular project. It's a World Wildlife Fund example, so maybe David will talk more specifically about it. Um, it's on the island of uh, Palawan, a community called Rojas. Several different project components were embedded within this effort. One had to do with reproductive health, so bringing health services and reproductive health services specifically to communities in this area. The reproductive health portion of the program included family planning action sessions where they talked about family planning and the options available, and also community-based distributors, so actually the provision or the facilitating the provision of supplies. <coughs> this is one of the family planning action sessions. I thought this was needed was uh, the way that they talked to couples about the integration between population and the environment. And this is a woman who acts as a um, community health worker and a community-based distributor of commodities, family planning commodities, and another one with her happy, happy face in her bag. The project also includes uh, conservation elements, so they did some ecological assessments of the marine areas around these communities and are working to establish protected areas, so you see both the health and the environment um, combined. And this is just, they're doing some really detailed spatial mapping. Um, 
This is actually an alternative livelihood program that's funded by a different group, but they're farming sea cucumbers to try to take some of the pressure off of the fisheries. And this is the dugong, which is part of the motivation um, an endangered species. In other PHE programs, you might find microcredit efforts to facilitate alternative livelihood strategies. So trying to pull some of the pressure off the environment by allowing people to create other ways of making a living. You might also find advocacy, um, efforts to use the media to increase public and policymakers' awareness of these population health environment linkages. You also find capacity building, efforts to increase collaboration among local groups to enhance local leadership capacity and also research, my particular passion, um, integrating research into these endeavors to um, improve understanding of the linkages between these pop health and environment dimensions. So there's your illustration. Let's think now about the rationale. Why integrate these different components into these projects? And there's some really interesting hypotheses about the added value that's gained by bringing these different components together within an effort. Of course, you add value by addressing multiple community needs simultaneously, and in that way gain efficiencies in delivery. A very interesting hypothesis that I think has yet to be tested uh, sufficiently is that you may add value with regard to reproductive health efforts by opening the doors to conversations about reproductive health with a couple of interesting communities, one being men. Right, it suggested that men may want to talk about or be interested in talking about family planning if you relate it to, say, for example, in the Philippines, fish. If men link the size of their family to the amount of time they have to spend fishing, they might be interested in thinking about how big their family is. Right? So that's an interesting idea about linking the environmental context with conversations about family planning. And also to youth, and John will talk a little bit more about that. But it appears as though when you're talking about sustainability of particular practices for generations, you may engage youth. As far as for conservation efforts, um, another hypothesis is that when women can better manage their childbearing, they may be better able to manage natural resources. So empowerment of women should have environmental gains and healthy families might have longer term visions, and of course in the long run, population pressures might be reduced, which should have environmental gain. Another interesting rationale, a moral rationale, and we heard this from a lot of folks, it seems it's the right thing to do, right? PHE programs often target the most remote, the most marginalized communities, so in that sense, it just feels as though there's a moral um, sort of rationale for these kinds of programs. A quick note on foundations, these aren't, you know, didn't just come out of thin air, they are grounded in um, a history of a, diff of a variety of different kinds of integrated programs. Um, they have roots in the ICDP, the Integrated Conservation and Development Programs from the mid-80s that brought together alternative livelihoods and conservation efforts. But of course these things evolved in different ways across settings, across different contexts, across different organizations, but now we find PHE programs in this vein, in several places and undertaken by several different organizations. On conclusions, so overall there are community-based integrated programs that really try to identify these linkages across these three dimensions that really shape well-being, oftentimes focused on biodiversity hotspot areas, at least the USAID programs. The integration aims to add value to see what would um, potentially be gained by single sector efforts. So gaining efficiencies by bringing together these different uh, components. PHE programs can include advocacy, capacity building, and research. And there are a lot of lessons that could be learned from past integration efforts since these didn't just come out of thin air. There you go. There's a foundation. <laughs>